Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Dylan and I'm joined by none other than Mr. Dan Harlacker. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. And we have some very, very exciting news about On One Photo Raw 2020 for you all today. Yeah, I'm really honored to be the first person to actually get to show you guys Photo Raw 2020. What we're looking at today is the public beta, which is available today. You can go to the On One website and download it. Now, I think most of you guys probably are familiar with Photo Raw. It's the app for managing and editing and working on your photos. Some of you might be new to it. So let me tell you a little bit about it and then we'll jump into what's new in 2020. So with Photo Raw 2020, it allows you to find and manage your photos, do your editing, enhance and raw processing, sharing, all in a single application that gives you the simplicity of a browser. You don't have to go through and catalog your photos to use it. The power of a raw processor, along with all the effects and all the portrait retouching you need, and that's all inside of a layered and non-destructive workflow. It's incredibly powerful. And 2020 includes over 20 brand new features. You can see the list of them there. I wanna go through and show you as many of these as we can. Uh, before we do that, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about performance. Performance is kind of a hard thing to show in a video. It's something you really have to feel. And when you get the beta and you download it and try, you'll really see the difference. So let me just explain a little bit about some of the important, uh, important performance improvements that we have made. Now with every release, we have a dedicated team of engineers who work on nothing but making Photo Raw faster. And this time is no different and they have improved things in two key areas. One is opening raw photos. So as you open a photo from browse into develop or you're changing photos in the film strip inside of develop, it's much, much faster. Uh, we've done that by using the GPU more for opening those raw photos. We've also gotten smarter at moving data in and around the system. We've also reduced the amount of memory that's needed to do that by about 25% as well. Let's dig into some of the numbers for those performance improvements. Let's look at raw photos. Raw photos open twice as fast as they used to. On my laptop, opening a Sony A7R3 file used to take almost six seconds. Now it takes just over two seconds to open those photos, so much faster. It's all by leveraging that GPU. For me, it's as fast as Lightroom, and it's faster than just about everything else out there. And if you're opening a photo that you've just recently edited, let's say you're in develop and you're changing photos in the film strip, if it's a photo you've recently opened, it's instantaneous to open that photo because we cache it, we hold on to it in memory. And it's not just raw photos, but on photos and PSD, those layered files are much faster too. They're actually three times faster to open a PSD or open an on photo. But the area that you're probably gonna notice the most is brushing. Brushing is super important. People buy photo raw because they like to do masking. They like to apply adjustments in local areas. Brushing is a critical part of that, to have a nice, natural feeling brush. Now on most systems, you've had a good experience in the past, but if you had a really big display, these 4K and 5K displays that are popular now, especially on a Windows laptop that might have an underpowered video card, but yet still a very large display, the brushing wasn't up to snuff. So we've worked really hard to get constant time, 30 frames per second, a nice, natural feeling brush all the time, no matter how big your monitor or how powerful your video card is. It's a really big difference, and I think Windows users are really going to appreciate that difference. I was playing with the brushing earlier today, and you can definitely tell a huge difference when you're brushing around. Yeah. Masking is so much easier now. Yeah. Yep. You don't have to brush slowly and yeah. hope you're getting the hope right Yeah. It's nice just all right there. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. All right. So that's kind of the performance stuff. And you'll see some of this. I'll kind of highlight some of it as we actually work that you can actually kind of feel in a, in a video rather than something you have to actually use the beta for. Let's talk about what's new in Browse. So in Browse, we added a ton of new features. There's a new map view, so you can see where your photos were taken. There's a date pane that makes it easy to find your photos by date. We've improved search by adding save search. We've added a new printing dialog, so you can do package printing and contact sheets, so you can publish a smug mug. There's also a new focus overlay that helps you see what parts of your photo are in focus. I'm gonna walk you guys through how these work here. Let's jump here into Photo Raw. First off, you notice it looks a little bit different yeah, than the previous version. Yeah, shiny new interface there. Yeah. It's a little more modern, a little more flat in its appearance. It's a new font that we think is easier to read, especially at small sizes. All right, so let's jump in and look at some of the new browse features. The first one I wanted to show you was that map view. So let me find some photos to look at. Here we go. I've got some photos. These all have GPS metadata on them. So if you look over here in my EXIF tab of the metadata pane, there's GPS. That means when the photos were taken, the camera had a GPS that recorded where it was taken. Over here in the view mode selector, you know you have grid view and detail view and compare view. There's a new view mode right there, map view. And when I switch over to map view, you'll actually see that photo in the location that it was captured. There's a satellite view. That's the one that I typically use, but there's also a street view version of that as well. And as I change from photo to photo, you'll see how it automatically takes me to that location. So this one happens to be photographed, I think, at Antelope Canyon, if I recall. Yep, there we go. There's the parking lot right there. There's the slot canyon and the spot where the photographer was shooting at. Let me pick 
pick up the edit from here. Okay. Here's another one photographed in the, the Mount Hood uh, National Forest shooting towards Mount Hood. Now one thing I've noticed though is it has my GPS kind of off the trail off in these trees. Obviously I wasn't there. Sometimes the GPS isn't all that accurate on the cameras. It was really shot over here at the top on this viewpoint up here. We had to climb up to the top of this viewpoint to take it. So I can change the GPS just by right clicking on the map and saying set the location to here. And now it's updated the GPS location to the real spot that it was taken at. Very handy. You can also use it to assign a GPS location to photos that don't have anything. If we take a look over here, I got this last picture of a sand dune. I actually shot this in uh, Florence, Oregon. It has no GPS data. The camera didn't record that. So I can go right up here to the search field and I just type in Florence and I can find it. And I just pick out Florence and it'll zoom my map right to the city of Florence. And all I do is just look from the satellite view to see where I photographed it at. Now I happen to know that I shot it in the sand dunes right over here behind the big Fred Meyer store. There's a big piece of sand dunes. Anyone from Oregon probably knows where this is. There's the <laughs> Fred Meyer. Easy. Here's my <laughs> secret sand dunes. I guess it's not a secret anymore, <laughs> but it's my favorite spot to go shoot sand. And I'm just gonna right click and say, set that to my location. And there you go, you see it picked up that GPS location. So I can assign locations to photos that don't have any. I can also get other metadata as well. So I can select all of these photos and I could go to the photo menu and use the set location from GPS coordinates option. That will take the GPS, it goes up to the internet, gets the uh, location, the city, the state, the country, and populates it for all those photos. So now if I look in my IPTC metadata and I scroll down here to the city, you can see like this photo was shot in Dundee. It knows it was shot in Dundee, Oregon, United States. The cool thing is I can now search by that. So if you take all your photos that have GPS and you go out and you look up their address, you can now go to the search field and you just type in the name of the city or wherever you're at and it'll find it for you. Makes it much easier to find your photos. All right, that is the new map view. Let's talk about another way to find your photos and that is the date pane. So you notice over here on the left hand side, there's a pane called date and inside of it, I can roll it down and I have folders for every year that I've photographed. This is automatically populated by all your catalog folders. So anything you put in the catalog folder, you can now search and sort by date very quickly here in the date pane. Let's say I want to find all the photos I photographed last year in 2018. So I just click on 2018, it'll go out and find all of those photos. Now that's for the entire year of 2018. Let's say I want to be more precise. I'm just looking for ones I shot in the summertime. So maybe I want to go to July. There we go. Now it finds just the ones that were photographed in July. I can roll that down and I can even narrow it down to a specific day, like July 5th. There we go. There's just the photos that I shot on that one day. So it's easy if I have my calendar, I can look up when did I shoot something and I can quickly zip to where those photos are at. If I'm looking for client photos, for example, or something like that. I mean, it's a birthday. Just yeah, find a birthday photo. Yeah, it's a birthday event. Or Christmas yeah. or any holiday. It's a very quick way to jump and find those very quickly. All right, what else do we got in here? Let's do some printing. So printing is a really important part of a lot of photographers' workflow. A lot of us believe that the photo doesn't really live until it's on paper. So we have really improved the print experience. I'm going to grab a handful of photos here that I like from a recent shoot. So here's some of my favorite food shots that we did a few weeks ago. I'm going to select all these. I want to print 5 by 7s of them. So I'm just going to select them, click on the print button over here on the right. When I do that, the print dialog is going to come up. All right. When it, the print dialog comes up at the top, there's the printer section. That's where you pick whether you want to print it or you want to print it out and create a PDF document instead. You choose your printer and your page size and orientation and all the stuff you're used to on any print dialog. There's a color section that's very important. This is where you pick the profile for your printer and the rendering intent you want to use. So it'll automatically pick up all of the color profiles that come with your printer driver. Those will show up. Plus you can also import your own custom printer profiles into it as well. And when you toggle the soft proof option on over here, it'll even change the preview to show with that profile oh. applied. So you see exactly what it's going to look like when it prints on that particular paper. All of that's pretty straightforward. That's the stuff you've seen in the existing print dialog. The stuff below in print area is all new. This is where you can control how many photos are laid out on a page. So right now I have it set to the fit option. So it's going to fit that photo at its natural size onto the, in this case, letter size paper. Let's say I want to make five by sevens instead. So I'll just grab the five by seven style. It splits the page into two five by seven holes and it fills each of those. So I get a five by seven in each of those holes. And as I change pages down here, you can see how those photos are going to fit into a five by seven. It'll automatically rotate them to fit. 
And right now I have it set so that it'll fill that five by seven area. Because I have some of mine cropped to a square, I'm gonna switch over to fit. So I'll keep the actual cropped aspect ratio. I don't lose any of the photo, but it's printed in a five by seven area, just like that. You could also add a watermark to it. So let's say I wanted to add a watermark to each photo. I can pick my watermark file. We actually come with a couple right out of the box. There's a copyright symbol, which is great if you just want to put kind of a screen back copyright logo on them, or you can use the new Made With On One logo, which will mm. identify that you've used On One to do it, or you can import your own file and create your own watermark and save your watermarks for future use. You can also add additional sharpening to it, which is typically something you want to do when you print. You want to add final output sharpening. You can do that right here in the sharpening pane as well. All right. You can view those in a single page view. You can also do a facing page view, or even you can see all pages at once. So you can kind of see what the entire job is going to look like. Or if you don't want to do this, you can also print contact sheets. So there's a contact sheet mode as well. So if I switch over to contact sheets, you'll see thumbnails of your photos. You have the file name is underneath it. And I can even control how many columns I want. So maybe I want bigger thumbnails. I'll pick the three column contact sheet mode just like that. That's awesome. Such an intuitive little print shop. Just yeah. right in, yep. Yeah, I find it super handy. You know, like uh, uh, Whitney, my wife, she has to uh, print two photos onto a four by six borderless and she sends them off to, to her lab and she cuts them in half and uses them for her scrapbooking project. Well, it's pretty easy for me to do that. I could come in here, let's just pick a size, four by six borderless. And on those, I want to have a width of four and a height of three and voila. Perfect. It's laid those out so I get two three by fours on a four by six borderless and then I can print them or send them off to my lab just like that. All right, that's the powerful new print dialog. But not everybody prints. Some people want to share online instead. So we actually have uh, integration with SmugMug now. We make it really easy to take your photos and share them with the premium provider of websites for photographers, SmugMug. To share, click over here on the share button and select SmugMug. When you do that, the SmugMug dialog is going to pop up. I'm already signed in. If you haven't signed in, it'll ask you to sign into your SmugMug account. Then you pick where you want to publish those photos to. You pick which gallery you want to put them in. You could create a new gallery too, which is something you're going to do. Let's say you come back from a job, you've picked out your favorites, you want to share them with a client. So you'd select those photos. I would come down, I would say create a gallery. I'd put in the client's name. I can control where it goes on my SmugMug website. So there's a folder structure, so I can have galleries inside of folders. So I can pick where I want to put it. And I can even make it a private gallery so it's not listed. I can then give the URL to that to my client. No one else is going to see it, just the client would see it, for example. I'm going to put these in my food fund gallery. And I can control how big they are. I can do the original full-size photos, which I would do like for client delivery. But most of the time, I'm just posting to the web for fun. So I could use either a 4,000 or a 2,000 pixel on the long side option instead. I've already published these. Let me show you what it looks like. I can just click on the open gallery button here. And I can see my photos published to that gallery here inside of SmugMug. And when I click on a photo, I see a larger version. I can share it. I can even get more information about it if I wanted to. You might have to add a background on that SmugMug account, Dan. It's looking a little bland. Yeah, I don't know why that. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not using it right. It's on my homepage. It doesn't go up on that gallery. I don't know why. All right, let's jump back and see if there's anything else we haven't talked about. All right, so there's one other thing I want to show you in Browse, one other improvement, and that is what we call Focus Mask View. It allows you to see what's in focus in a photo. I'm going to use a series of photos that I actually shot for uh, uh, Focus Stacking because it's a really good way to illustrate how it works here. Because each of these photos has a fairly narrow area that's in focus, and it changes from photo to photo. To turn that mode on, you go to the View menu, and right next to the Clipping View is the new Show Focus Mask View. It'll highlight whatever's in focus in green. So I can see in this photo, the areas of sharpest focus is right here on the left. And as I change from photo to photo, as the focus changes in the photo, you can see how that green highlight of what's in focus changes to match with it. Wow. So it's a really great way to help you pick out the sharpest photo in a series. If I was shooting a portrait and I'm shooting wide open with like a 1.8 lens, I could look at a series of them and I could see which one is in focus where right inside a browse without having to zoom into 100% and try to remember. It actually kind of gives me an analytical way of looking at what's in focus. Very powerful tool. All right, so that's all of the new stuff in Browse. Now, let's move on and talk about what's new inside of Develop. Actually, edit that, we'll come back here. 
Okay. All right, that's all the new stuff in Browse. There's a couple things I'm going to mention. You also have control over your catalog preview size now. So when you create a new catalog folder, you can uh, pick how big the previews are that we store for that. Normally, we create a fairly large one so that you can have a full screen view. It makes your browsing very fast. But that kind of assumes that you're on the same computer that the photos live on and that you've got a, a big hard drive. If your photos live somewhere else, on a file server or a NAS drive, and you've got lots and lots of photos, we have some photographers who have been in the business for 20 years, and they have a million photos on a NAS drive, that's going to fill up your hard drive pretty quickly with previews. So now you can add a catalog folder for that file share, pick a smaller preview size, so it'll catalog the NAS faster. You'll still be able to search and browse it very quickly, but all the previews will fit on something small like a laptop. Also another benefit for people who use those NAS drives, if you're on a Windows computer, we can now support what are called UNC paths. That means you don't have to map a network share to a volume. You don't have to make it your K drive or your P drive or your Z drive in order to see it. You'll just be able to navigate to it just like a normal drive. Plus, we've also improved our CR3 format support. It now supports all cameras that shoot CR3, both compressed and uncompressed. All right, so that's all the new stuff in Browse. Let's take a look at some of the cool new stuff inside of Develop. All right, when it comes to develop, the biggest change for me is the new faster file opening. We can open those raw photos twice as fast in many cases, but there's a lot of other cool stuff in here I'm gonna talk about. There's the new AI match and AI auto tools, improved noise reduction and highlight recovery, and you can create custom camera profiles. So let's jump in and take a look at those. First, let's show you how fast it is to open some photos. I'm gonna go grab some big photos. I've got some really big ones in here. These are from a D850. Any of you guys who are familiar with the D850, it's a big camera. It's like 8,000 pixels. I think it's like a 50 <laughs> mega, megapixel camera. Really big one. Let's go into film strip view. And oh, let's turn that focus mask off. And I'm going to zoom in. So I'm actually going to zoom in to 100% on this photo. So it actually is loading the full raw data in order to show us this. So when and I go into edit, edit, that the photo doesn't disappear, it doesn't become pixelated. We're right where we want it to be, right where we were already panned on the photo at 100%. And it was instantaneous. Now when I want to change photos, so let's say I move over to this photo here, I click on this one, 1001, 1002, it takes about two seconds to open those big 50 megapixel photos. Here we go again, 1001, 1002, two and a half, so you know, Jeez. two, two and a half seconds to open those. These are Mondo photos. Yeah. The other cool thing is we hold those in memory. So if we go back to a photo we were just on, let's say I go back to this one, it was instantaneous. I didn't have to wait to reload the photo at all. Very, very fast. And if I wanted to apply some settings to this photo, I'll just hit the auto button. In this case, let me go back to a fit view. When I go back to browse on this photo, It goes back instantly, the photo doesn't go black, it doesn't go pixelated, all of my results are already ready, it's already done. So it's a smoother experience going between browse and edit and between photos inside of edit. All right, now let's talk about that new AI match and AI auto. Let me grab some photos that we can play with here. This is probably one of my favorite features in the new 2020. It is pretty sweet. It's amazing, yeah. All right, let's start with this one here. All right, so in the past, here in the tone and color pane, there was just a simple auto button, which applied a fairly basic auto algorithm for adjusting the tone in your photo. We've improved that a ton with a new AI auto feature. We looked at thousands of photos, we analyzed them, and came up with the better auto algorithm. It does a better job of maintaining the highlight details in your photo, and it doesn't adjust the contrast or the exposure as much. So it does a better job of making it look natural. We've also added another third option now called AI Match. What AI Match does is it actually works on a raw photo, it looks at the embedded JPEG, and it will match our processing to the embedded JPEG. The embedded JPEG is what you see on the back of the camera, it's what the camera processes. So if you like what you see on the screen on the back of your camera, think of this as back of camera mode. When I press that, it's going to match what I saw when I took the picture. So let me show you. Here's a raw photo, shows up in color. I actually shot this in black and white mode in my camera. Of course, being a raw photo, it's in color, but I can hit that AI match and it knows it was black and white and switches it over. This is what it looked like on the back of my camera. Pretty cool. Let's go for another one. This happens to be a Fuji raw file. The Fujis have all sorts of crazy color options. You can pick different film emulations and things like that. So let's hit the AI match on this one. And you notice it goes from the default colorful processing and it's going to pick up that this photo was actually shot with one of their desaturated film looks, like the color neg high. So you can see it's a little more desaturated, a little flatter. It looks, again, the mode that I asked it to shoot in the camera. 
So it's pretty handy. Now, that said, the processing from the camera is not always the best. If it was always the best, we'd always just shoot, shoot JPEG. JPEG. <laughs> there would be no need to shoot RAW. <laughs> the reason we shoot RAW is that we have the ability to make lots of those edits. So sometimes uh, AI match is a good starting point, but you're going to go in and you're going to make adjustments to it, or you might not like what the camera's interpretation was and you want to do it on your own. So here's another photo. Let's use AI match to start. So you can see it picked up the color, filtered out that blue color cast. It looks a little bit better, but watch what happens when I hit the auto button. Instead, we use AI auto. It's really going to bring up those shadows. Yeah. It's much more vivid and a lot more detail in the shadows. The cool thing is you notice there's an auto slider. This works in both AI match and in AI auto. You can actually fade the amount of that auto adjustment that you want. So a lot of times the full strength auto might be a little more than you like. So I could dial it down to like 80% mm -hmm. and get just the amount of auto that I want. This is what I find myself doing all the time. I just hit the auto button and then I just wiggle that slider until I get what I want. It's a lot easier yeah. than going through and finessing each individual slider. Most of the time the software is pretty, pretty intelligent. Yeah, it's a pretty good <laughs> yeah. software. So I'll show you a couple other photos uh, so you guys can really see how good that AI auto is. Let me grab a different photo here. And I'm just going to hit the AI auto button. And oh, yeah. voila. You can see it kept all the detail in the highlights and the snow. Those didn't go blown out. The exposure of the photo didn't change. The contrast didn't really change. What it really did is it focused on the highlights and the shadows to compress that total range down and make a more pleasing photo. I'll show you another one. Here's one. This was a dark exposure so that everything in the sky is captured. A normal auto algorithm, you'd press it, it would blow out all the detail in the clouds. You wouldn't have that. Watch what happens when we press AI auto. There we go. Perfect. We get all the detail in the water and in the rocks in the foreground without sacrificing any of the detail on the clouds. It's a much more intelligent algorithm for adjusting your photos. Speaking of intelligent algorithms, we've also improved noise reduction. Let me jump over and I'll show you what the new noise reduction algorithm looks like. Yeah, this would be great for the Milky Way shooters out there. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you get those micro four thirds sensors that are smaller, they tend to be mm -hmm. a little bit more noisy. Uh, this does a great job of getting rid of that really big clunky noise. So this was actually a D600 photo. This is actually from uh, Jim Cho, one of our developers here who actually writes the software. This is one of his photos. Let's take this, I'm gonna go into edit. I'm gonna use AI match because I want it to match what it looked like when Jim shot it, get his intentions. There we go. That's looking pretty good. Looks Let's zoom in. I'm going to zoom in a bunch. I'm going to zoom in really close so you guys can really see the noise in this photo. So you notice this photo has a little bit of a color cast to it. While we're here, let's just use the gray dropper and I'll just click to kind of remove that. That kind of gets it to be a more natural look. There we go. That's a little cleaner. All right. Let's zoom back in here a couple times so we can really get in close on that door so we can see it. To adjust the noise reduction, it's in the details pane. And it works just like the old one. You notice there's now a little box here that shows which version of noise reduction you're using. Any new photo you work on is going to use the 2020 version. Any photo that you've worked on in the past will actually say 2017. What we don't want to do is change the look of your photo out from underneath you. Yeah. But you can always take one of those old photos, switch to the new noise reduction, and adjust it to get take advantage of that new, better quality noise reduction. Let me show you how I adjust it. I'm going to go to the luminance slider. I'm going to hold down the option key or the alt key on my keyboard. And that makes it grayscale. That makes it easier to see the noise and not get confused with the color noise. I'm really focusing on just the grayscale component of the photo. And as I adjust this up, you can smooth out the noise. Now, the amount of noise reduction is definitely a personal taste thing. I tend to actually like the noise. I think it's kind of what makes it appear like a photo, not a painting. But I'm going to turn it up pretty high just for illustration purposes here. I'm going to go up to like 50 or 60. So you can see that really smooths out the sky, smooths out the wood, then the detail slider will bring back the fine details in that without bringing back the noise. So I'll do the same thing, hold down that option key, bring the detail slider back, and it's going to bring that back until I start to see the noise appear in the sky again. And that'll give me the best balance of sharp details and noise reduction. And then for the color, you notice there's some diffuse color noise, especially in the sky. This is probably a pretty long exposure, yeah, 25 second long exposure. So you get kind of that big green and red modeling in the sky. I'll just grab the detail slider under the color section, hold that down. You'll see just the color in the photo. You can kind of see that modeling in the sky. I'm just going to bring that up until that modeling goes away about there. There we go. So that helps reduce that. Let me turn it on and off so you can see. There's before with all the noise. 
and after, nice. after reducing those. And keep in mind, we're zoomed in at 300% here. This is really, really close. So, you know, normally what you only see, especially in a print, is going to be at 100% like this. Mm -hmm. So, very Looks much clean better. though, too, yeah. yeah. Much better. And it didn't blow out all the stars. No. You know, the old algorithm, you would have lost a lot of those stars during the noise reduction. All right. There's also going to be improved highlight recovery that'll be coming. It's not in this first beta, but in the second beta coming, you'll be able to take advantage of the new highlight recovery. You just got to get better highlight recovery, especially on uh, higher ISO or longer exposure images. And let's talk about custom camera profiles. So custom camera profiles allow you to create a fingerprint for your camera for a specific camera and lighting and shooting situation. It's really handy if you're a studio photographer and you're shooting in the studio with the same lights, doing the same camera all the time. This will really reduce the need to go in and do color corrections or color adjustments. You're going to get true to life colors all the time. So let me show you how to create one. I'm going to start down here. Let me grab a photo and reset these. All right, in order for this to work, you need to make sure you take a photograph of a color target, a color checker. We worked with X-Rite to develop this feature. So it'll work with color checkers, it'll work with color checker passports, it'll work with color checker XRs, the big ones. Uh, basically, you just photograph a target in your scene. You wanna make sure it's lit by the same light that your subject's gonna be lit by, and that you don't change your white balance. Your white balance needs to stay at the same setting throughout all of your shooting for this to work. So you take that photo, make sure it's properly exposed, then, Go into edit, and don't worry, this is not the only video on how to do this. We'll have a video and a PDF that'll show you guys how to do this as well. Open it into edit. I'm gonna neutralize it. That means I'm gonna grab the gray dropper. I'm gonna click on one of the known gray targets, either the second or the third one, and that's gonna remove any color cast from the image so that what is gray in the scene is now gray in my processing. There we go, I've neutralized it. Now I'm gonna export out a special TIFF file that we're gonna use to build a profile. To do that, we'll go to the export pane. You want to make sure your file type is set to TIFF. You want to make sure that the color space is set to camera calibration space. This is going to create a special TIFF design just for building profiles. I'm going to save it to my desktop. Then I'm going to send that to the calibration software. I'm going to use X-Rite's color checker camera software. This is a free download that you could use if you have any of the color checker targets. Then I'm just going to take that TIFF file that I created, I'm going to drop it right in here. It'll open that TIFF file, it'll find the color checker target patches automatically. If for some reason it didn't find them, you just grab these little green circles and you adjust it so that each of the squares are over the squares in the color checker. And then you hit create profile. And that's gonna create a standard ICC profile that's gonna allow us to translate our raw processing to what those exact colors were in real life on that color checker. I've already created that profile. Let me show you how to use it now. So here, back inside of develop, from the camera profile pop-up, you see there's a new option that says import. I just select import. I go point it to where I saved that profile. In this case, I put it on my desktop right there. I'll open that up and it'll apply the profile. So now the colors in that color checker target are what they're supposed to be. x right knows exactly what those colors are in real life. Now my photo matches it. I can now use the settings on any other photos that I shot under the same lighting conditions. So if I open up my film strip here, I have another photo that I shot at the exact same time. I'm just gonna select it. I'll hit the sync button. and This will apply those same settings to it. And now that photo will look yeah. correct as well. So that's remove the color cast and all my colors are true to life. All right. So when you add a camera profile and you import it, is it, it stays there, you don't have to import it again, right? Correct. Sure. We, once you've imported that profile, will always appear inside the camera profile list and you can make as many as you need for different lighting scenarios, or different cameras. And it's just saved as part of the settings for that individual photo. Now, we're not gonna automatically apply that every time we see a photo from that camera that's a little heavy handed because you might create mm -hmm. multiple profiles. But once you've set it for that photo, it stays just like any other setting you do inside of develop. All right, so that's all the new stuff in develop. Now let's talk about the new stuff inside of effects. 
So in effect, there's a brand new curated preset library. We actually work really hard to come up with a library of over 300 new presets that really match the styles that we're seeing out there. Everything is popular on the internet, everything you see popular in print advertising, there's now preset looks to make that very easy. I'll show those to you here in a minute. You can also fade your presets directly from the browser. There's four new filters, and when you do the split screen, you can actually move the slider. So let's show you this stuff in action. I'm gonna jump back over to browse for a second, and let's grab some different photos to work with. So here, inside of browse, I'm just gonna select a photo. I'm gonna switch over to my preset tab instead of my browse tab so I can see my presets. I'm going to switch over to my preset tab, and whoa, you notice the presets look a lot different from these. They used to just be names of categories, and there, there weren't that many of them, right? <laughs> so there's more categories, more options, and we give you a visual thumbnail for them to help you understand what the contents of that category does. Let me make my preset browser a little bit bigger here so we can see. So there's, instead of being a single black and white category, there's now four black and white categories, four, four different styles of black and white photography. There's color grading, there's lots of different popular matte looks that are divided up based on what you're photographing. So if you're photographing food, there's a category, the culinary category, that's perfect for that matte look that's popular for food photography on Instagram, for example. Let me show you how to use it. I'm just going to, and again, remember I'm in browse, I'm not even in effects here. I can open up a category, like the color grading category, and I can scroll through that list. I see my photo with the presets applied. When I want to try one, I just click on it. You can see how it applies that look automatically. And then from the fade slider that appears, I can control how strong that is. It's just like adjusting the master opacity slider in effects without having to go into effects. So I can dial in just how strong I want that look to be. This is kind of my new workflow. I, I open my photo, I hit that AI auto button, I adjust the slider to what I like, and then I add a preset and I adjust the fade slider to what I like, and boom, you know, and like... And you export. Two, yeah, two clicks and now I print. Yeah, <laughs> so, there you go. You know, you it's very quick and easy to create great looking stuff without having to twiddle with a million sliders. Yeah. All right, so let me show you some of the other categories in here that I really like. So I mentioned there's that culinary category. So let's take a food shot and... I'm gonna go down here, let's find that culinary category. So the culinary category, uh, if you've paid attention to Instagram, you look at a lot of these shots, they tend to have a little bit of a matte look and the, they're a little bit sharper, they kind of have that dynamic contrast look. So we basically combine some dynamic contrast with some of those subtle clean matte looks to create these. So like number five is one of my favorites. So there you go, I can click on that. Oh yeah. Add it to my photo. And again, just use that phase slider to dial in just how much of that look I want. Another really popular new look is what I call deep forest. You know, we're here in the Pacific Northwest. If you see a lot of the outdoor adventure photography that's captured in the Northwest, it has kind of this dark green matte look to it. Um, so we've worked really hard to create some very powerful examples of that dark forest look. Let me show you. I'll just pop open the Quick View browser. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So you can actually audition oh, those yeah. presets right here. Let's say I really like that first one. There you go just like that. There's that popular dark forest look all done in a single clip. Now, it's not just presets, there's also four new filters that are in effects as well. So let me walk you through those cool new filters. Let's start off with this one. Let me go into effects. I'll click on the add filter button. And we're gonna show you the first one, which is the channel mixer. Any of you guys who are diehard Photoshop users are familiar with the channel mixer. It was used to be the way you'd convert your photos to black and white. Now the black and white filter in effects I still think is the best way for most black and white conversions. But the one thing it can't do is an infrared because to do an infrared you really have to overdrive individual channels to do it. So there's a really powerful, strong black and white infrared look built into the channel wow. mixer. That's gonna take those blue skies, make them black. It's gonna take the green in the foreground, make it white so it looks very infrared. There's a couple other places where the channel mixer is useful as well. One is if you're doing infrared photography, you actually have a camera and you put an infrared cutoff filter on it. The look of those color photos is very different. This gives you the ability to do an IR channel swap, which will swap the yellow and blue mm -hmm. so that you can actually create a, a, a proper blue looking side. This photo, it's obviously looks a little different because mm -hmm. uh, it's not an infrared photo. The other fun thing you can do is there's all sorts of cool false color looks you can do where you can really just take colors and shift them in completely uh, unnatural directions and it can make some pretty fun things. Like I've seen a lot 
Uh, I've seen that. Look, yeah, yeah. That's an especially in sand dunes and things like that in the desert. That's yeah. a super sand popular dunes, look. Sand dunes fall. Mm -hmm. I tend to use it at only about fifty percent power. But you notice how the greens kind of become orange. It kind of makes everything look fall. It takes the sky and it kind of pushes the blues to more of a cyan look. This is another very popular look right now as well. As a matter of fact, you'll find presets for this in the gold autumn category. We'll cool. actually have those built in too. All right. So those are just some samples of what you can do with the channel mixer. Let's take a look next at the weather filter. You have to fix that guy. Just uh, we need to fix that. Yeah. Really? Could you remove it from the Could thing? Me? What if you reset it? The weather filter allows you to add realistic fog and snow or rain to your photos. Let's start with the precipitation first. At the top, you can pick what kind of weather you want. There's snow and rain textures that are built in here. I'm just going to flip through these till I find one I like. Ooh, I kind of like that one right there. That one looks pretty cool. The opacity slider controls how strong that snow is. The scale slider controls how big that snow is. Kind of simulates whether you're shooting at a wide angle or a telephoto lens. I shot this wide, or actually Hudson shot this wide, so we're going to leave it set to the wide position. And then you can add in some fog to it as well. So it'll add some mm. realistic fog. You can control how strong it is, obviously, but you can also control where it's applied. So you can have it be a gradient from the top to the bottom or the left to the right, so that you can match the fog with your depth of field. The further away, the thicker the fog is going to be, right? So in the foreground, I don't really have any fog because I'm standing right there. I don't have fog. So I've got it set to the top half slow, so I can really control just where it goes. Now, this is a really fun filter, but I will tell you, it has to be a realistic photo. You can't take a bright sunny day in a park and make it look like it's snowing. Mm -hmm. It's just like changing a background in a photo. It has to be a plausible background for it. But if you have one of those typical Northwest days where it's very uh, hazy or it has a white sky with no clouds, it's pretty easy to make mm -hmm. it look like it's raining or snowing. Definitely. Yep, overcast days. Throw, throw a rain filter on there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it more interesting. <laughs> All right, now let me show you the third new filter, and that's the three-way color balance tool. It lives right here under color balance. Now, typically, the color balance tool is used to remove difficult color casts. If you, let's say you have a cool color cast in your shadows, if you're working in mixed lighting situations, it's a great way to affect the color in either the midtones, the highlights, or the shadows, but it's also a fun way to create tri-tint or tri-tone photos as well, or tinting. So that's what I'm doing this photo. This photo, had some gels that were purple as well as uh, an incandescent light. So we kind of have this purple gold mix. I really want to accentuate that. So I'm going to grab one of the styles in here called warm lavender. This is going to take the shadows and it's really going to pump them up and make them more of that lavender color. The amount slider controls how strong that is. So you can see as I turn that up, it's affecting the shadows more. I'm going to do it pretty high so you guys can see it. And then I'll go to my highlights. I want my highlights to be gold so that it lights up the highlights in her hair and the light. So I'm just going to turn the amount up. I can even turn the brightness up. Watch as I change the brightness, see how it actually is changing the brightness of the light. That's pretty crazy. There we go. I'm going to shift that color to be a little bit more yellow. Now, the only thing I don't like is her skin now has picked up a little bit too much of that lavender color. So I can just grab the midtones. I'll bring the amount up, and I'll just shift those midtones to a color that's going to clean up her skin. Probably somewhere in the yellows. So there we go. So I've managed to keep her skin a natural yellow, influence my shadows to be lavender, and have my highlights have that nice gold color to it. Just like that. Let me turn it on and off so you can see there's before and after. Oh, nice, yeah. subtle, yeah. subtle color balance. Subtlety is key with the portraits. You would definitely. know, Dan. You would definitely. know, Dan. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, last but not least, my favorite new filter. Same. The sun flare filter. <laughs> Same. All right. You guys are going to love this. All right. So we'll add filter. I'm going to go to sun flare. Sun flare allows you to add a realistic lens bokeh, or sun flares, or sunspots to your photo. Let's add a sunspot to this one. So I just select the sunspot mode here, and now I can flip through the different sunspot textures that are included. These all came from Matt Klaskowski. We worked very closely with Matt to develop this filter. I'm just going to flip through until I find one that I really like. And that one looks pretty good. I can control the amount of that sunspot. I can control its brightness if I want to make it 
more bright or less bright. I can even shift the hue and saturation of it as well. So maybe I want to bring the saturation up a little bit so that it really brings up more of that warmth in it. There's a move option where I can actually click to move and position that texture around different spots in my photo if I wanted to. And underneath I can add sunshine filter to it as well. So with it set to off, it's going to be very natural, but I can take that sunshine filter, I can bring it up, mm. pump up the sunshine, pump up the warmth in there. I can even reduce the contrast with the fade slider because you know you tend to lose a little contrast when that lens light hits your lens. You can dial in a perfect sunny day look just like that. That's great. Let me show you before and after. So there's before and after. One filter. All in one filter. As a matter of fact, the new split screen, I can actually yeah. show you a split screen before and after, and I can even move that slider back and forth. That Pretty is Pretty awesome. fun way to look at your results, compare your results. All right, so that's all the cool new stuff inside of effects. So I've walked you through all the new stuff in performance, all the new improvements like map view and print inside of browse, the powerful new noise reduction and AI match and AI auto and develop, plus all the new filters and curated preset library and effects. All of that makes up the new improvements in Photo Raw 2020. The last thing I want to show you guys is On One Sync. On One Sync is the future of Photo Raw. It takes what you love about Photo Raw and puts it on all of your computers and all of your devices. It lets you sync the photos that you care about to the devices that you care about. You don't have to have all your photos stored in the cloud, and you don't have to have room on every computer for every one of your photos. What it really empowers you to do is to view and edit your photos on any device. It can send them wirelessly from device to device, so the picture you take on your phone will automatically find its way back to your desktop. Even things like your albums and presets will synchronize across all of your devices as well. It really gives you the power of the cloud, but keeps you in control and lets it be flexible. You control where those files live. They don't all have to go live in the cloud. Let me show you how it works. Here we are, we're on my desktop computer, my desktop Windows computer, and I've got a network area storage device. It's got hundreds of thousands of photos, way more than I could ever fit on my laptop. So I'm just going to catalog that network storage device, and then I'm going to say publish that to sync. Now, all those photos on my network area storage device are accessible from any computer. So now here I am on my Mac laptop. In the on one sync section, I'll see my Windows computer, and the name of that share happens to be called My Studio. And inside of it, there's all those folders. I can view the photos, I can zoom, I can pan, I can change their metadata like ratings and labels. I can even edit them. I made this one black and white for this example. If I go back and I look at that photo on my Windows desktop computer, you'll notice that it's black and white now and it has five stars. All of those settings synchronized between the two. And it goes both directions. Let's say I want to create an album on my laptop and I want that to appear back on my Windows desktop. Same thing, I can select a series of photos, make it an album, publish that album, and then back there on okay. my Windows computer, there's that same album. So it makes it easy to share and create on all of your devices. Now right now, with uh, the beta of Photo Raw, you're not gonna see this, but when the final version comes out in October, you'll be able to be a beta tester for On One Sync, and then when the mobile apps come in early 2020, then you'll really be able to take advantage of it, and you'll have all of your photos and all of your devices. All right, as I mentioned, Sync is kind of the glue that holds together the new On One integrated workflow. So it's more than just Photo Raw. That's really the first place that you're going to see it, but there's the new On One video app coming for photographers who need to work with video. So they can create beautiful slideshows, time-lapse presentations, very seamlessly in a layout and in the words that photographers are used to. You don't have to be a video editor to create great videos. There's the mobile apps, which takes the best from Photo Raw on the desktop and puts it in your mobile device, including a brand new, very powerful raw camera feature for capturing great videos on your phone, editing them, and having your settings in the photo get back to your desktop automatically. And of course, On One Plus, premium education for photography and mastering On One Photo Raw, all in one spot. All right, now, Photo Raw is everything you need all in a single app. The beta is available today. The general release comes in October. We hope you all go and download the beta and give it a try. Thanks for watching today. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it.